for us at the Ford Foundation, the worker center field and an array of things that connect to it and the broader public debate about these issues is part of a larger conversation and I would uh, argue movement about imagining and creating a truly inclusive economy and a truly and deeply inclusive society. At GRIT TV, we are dedicated to giving meaningful attention to marginalized experts. And that's what this book does. It is meaningful, sophisticated, dare I say, almost academic um, in a good way. Analysis and reporting on the critical movements in this city that will be defining the future in many ways, but about whom we read way too little in our media, in our newspapers, and see way too little uh, on TV. I want to start with you, Ruth, by asking you a little bit about the process and maybe bringing some of the folks to their feet who contributed. How did this book get done? Thank you so much, Laura, and I just want to thank Ford, too, for, which provided some of the support for the research that went into the book. But most important, I want to thank the chapter authors, most of whom are here today. Could you all stand up? <coughs> and, <laughs> the people who just stood up worked really hard on this project. We did, too, but they really did the bulk of the work. So how it started was, I moved back. I thought, well, I needed to get a sense of the landscape here in New York. And um, I persuaded Ed, my colleague at the Murphy, to work with me on this project. And then we cooked up the idea of doing it as a course. And so we invited graduate students, both from the Graduate Center and from Murphy, who we thought might be interested to participate. And the condition of being in the class was that you had to agree to do a case study of a campaign or a worker center. Um, or you know some kind of organizing along these lines here in New York and so we got this fabulous group of students together and then well we met for one course then a second course then we had a conference which some of you were at a couple years ago um, then we put the resulting then people were meanwhile doing field work writing drafts meanwhile a lot of things changed here in New York in the course of the project one thing that changed which we discussed in the book a little bit is that many of the organizations we were studying decided to go national and then more recently, after the book had already gone to press, of course, Bill de Blasio became our mayor, which opens up all kinds of new possibilities. So it's been a very exciting journey. And it's true that these organizations are um, in their, you know, that none of them have really gotten to scale in the way that they all aspire to. And so that's the challenge ahead, among others. But we feel like no one before us has really taken the trouble mm. to document their work in detail. And so that's what the idea was. So we have community organizers, we have labor organizers, we have people who are doing a blend of the two, policy folks and, and union folks. Um, let me ask you, Ed, at the very end of this book, and I really did read every word, at okay. the very end of this book, you say that your work that is expressed and, 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 and captured in this book in many ways um, is some of the most important work, or I think you might actually say the most important work you've done in decades of a career in labor. Why? Well, you know, it's funny. I start my act, becoming active as a worker in the labor movement at the end of 1969. And if you think about all the stuff that went on, in many ways, uh, my career is a study in downward mobility. <laughs> I had been exposed to the notion that the labor movement, as it was structured, wasn't getting traction. As, as we moved through the 80s and into the 90s, and we have this wave of new workers coming to this country by the millions, and it was there was a lot of tension inside the union movement about these new workers. And uh, at that point, I really felt like the labor movement made a fatal mistake of accepting this category of legal and illegal workers. Uh, that was never the union's fight, never should have been. Anybody that walks through the door should have the same working rights, the, uh, the r same legal rights as every other worker. We really needed to begin to try to develop different relationships with a piece of the working class that were not in the unions. Mm. Uh, but it was when I really hooked up with the taxi workers and then the domestic workers and then uh, somewhat with the Restaurant Opportunities Center in New York that these collaborations really began to take on uh, a new form. Talk about the day that Barravi called you. At that point, I was the political director and soon to be an executive director of the Central Labor Council, although we didn't know it at the moment. And they had been reorganizing the taxi industry. The taxi industry had, in fact, been organized uh, in New York City 
into what was then the old, I'll say the old service employees union. Yeah. Um, and they had completely screwed it up to the point that they lost their right to bargain, the workers lost their health care, their pensions, uh, they were put on as contract workers, the entire industry. And the Taxi Workers Alliance, which also grew out of other movements, was trying to get traction in that industry. And there was a bill, a premature bill, that would have restored their status as employees. But there was nobody that was going to organize them outside of what I would call the gangsters. And our collaboration started on trying to figure out a strategy that would allow the Taxi Workers Alliance to defeat that bill. Um, and we did. And I asked Berve at the time, what do you, how much time do you need before you can organize them? She said, seven years. And there were very few union organizers around who would even have the patience, be willing to commit the energy and the resources to hang with something seven years. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was onto something mm. very special. I really feel that I'm bursting with joy today because I've never been more optimistic than I am today. Perfect when way to I begin. When I see the people <laughs> in this room and I know what you've done, we have a moment, we can take advantage of it, and we are remaking ourselves. Um, I also want to say that although I'm the person who's sitting here, there are a lot of people who are really responsible for what it is that the union has done. It was good to see Jeff Eichler here this morning, who is really the person who came to the union. And Jeff, I forget exactly when it was, but in the early 2000s, and brought the notion that the union and community have to be working closer together. I think for us, we understand that what has happened to the labor movement um, has been um, something very disappointing for all of us and disastrous for the middle class in this country. And that we have to reconceive ourselves to see us not just as a labor movement, but as the labor component of a broader progressive coalition. Our core experiment has been how do we get to scale with a model that maintains a real deep democratic tradition and real ownership of the folks who are most directly impacted by poverty and by the social issues that, that are affecting our day-to-day -day lives um, so that those folks lead their own campaigns, develop the sophistication to lead higher and higher level and more and more impactful campaigns um, as we go forward. Our members are generally very low wage, um, often no wage workers. Um, families who oftentimes have, um, are undocumented or have mixed immigration status in their families. Uh, and so they're, and they're mostly coming from, the, uh, from Latin American countries originally. Of course, what we're talking about generally in the, in the area of employment and workers' rights is just abuse all day long, right? And so, I mean, I think one thing that really deeply informs the way we look at worker organizing is that it's not just about raising wages. Of course, that is a critical thing, but it's about changing the power dynamic at work. Because if you go to work for 12 hours a day and you get treated literally like you are not a human being, and then you go home and you're supposed to, in the 12 hours of remaining daylight um, that you have each week with your children, you're supposed to parent them and care for them and teach them to be emotionally resilient human beings, it is just not possible, right? It is just not fair to expect people to thrive and grow as leaders in our communities when they have that abuse of power that is their experience every day on, on the job. Um, and so I, I think it's really that. It's, it's realizing that the same low wage workers we're working with on the job go to the hospital and get ignored, right? And go to the school conference and can't speak with their, parent, with their kids' teachers because they don't speak English. And, they're, and mean, then they get home and their son has been harassed again by the cops who stop and frisk them almost every day on the way home from school. Right? And so the layering of those experiences of the abuse of power is really what we're trying to construct um, a robust community organization to, to do battle with. Really the reason we've grown so fast as an organization is just the explosion in this industry. The restaurant industry right now is the second largest and absolute fastest growing industry in the United States. It's over 10 million workers. One in 12 Americans right now works in the restaurant industry. Uh, it's one of the only industries to grow over the last couple of years of economic crisis rather than decline, but it happens to be 
uh, the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. So every year the U.S. Department of Labor puts out the 10 lowest paying jobs in America and every year we win the award, seven of the 10 lowest paying jobs and the two absolute lowest paying jobs in America, actually lower than farm workers, lower than every other position in the United States are the people who touch our food. Uh, and so the, we've really done a lot of work to understand how it is that you've got the largest and fastest growing industry proliferating the mm -hmm. absolute lowest paying jobs in America and it is because of the power of the National Restaurant Association which has been named the 10th most powerful lobbying group in Congress and really is responsible for the minimum wage being set at the wage it is both for all workers and of course for tipped workers being stuck at $2.13 an hour. For so it was really understanding the the landscape of the industry, doing a power analysis, understanding how the NRA, the National Restaurant Association, we call it the other NRA works, um, really understanding all of that, that we built our tri-prong model, which is um, to surround the industry, build power for workers to really counterbalance the voice and power of the National Restaurant Association. And the three prongs are um, large, high-profile, organizing campaigns that uh, essentially use a combination of litigation and worker organizing um, to ultimately reach uh, agreements with employers that are able to win everything from raises to benefits to promotions to job security to um, new, we've won new HR departments uh, to promotions practices, a, a wide range of things. We've now won about 19 of these campaigns against large, high-profile companies. We've won, you know, we've won money, like nine or ten million dollars in stolen tips and wages, but much more important has been these agreements that now cover thousands of workers. And our current campaign is against the world's largest full-service restaurant company. The second prong of our work is promoting what we call the high road to profitability. So while I, I like to think of the first prong as creating consequences for the low road actors. With the high road, we've been organizing employers across the country. I mentioned our, our alternative national restaurant association called RAISE. Uh, we've worked with those employers to open our own worker-owned restaurants called Colors, New York, Detroit, now DC, New Orleans. So we help women of people of color move up to these livable wage jobs. And thanks to Ford, we've actually now managed to partner with community colleges across the country to get college credit for these training programs so workers actually get a college uh, certificate at the end of our training programs. And then in our third prong of work, we're doing research and policy work. So I've always had an academic role on the side, and we've partnered with about 100 academics around the country to publish, at this point, about 30 reports on the industry. Um, all of those reports have been participatory research. So I always like to say when we do 500 surveys, we always get 200 new members. Uh, it's, all, all, it's been the basis for the book I wrote last year, but it's also been the basis for local, state, and federal policy work. Um, and we've won some things, you know, we worked with others here to make sure tipped workers were included in the minimum wage increase back in 2005, although they were not in included in this most recent increase. We actually made it illegal to deduct credit card processing fees from workers' tips in Philadelphia. We just had a big victory in D.C. getting tipped workers included in the paid sick days ordinance there. But the big fight of our lives mm -hmm. for the last six years has been um, raising this abysmally low tip minimum wage of $2.13 an hour. When I talk about retail, when we talk to our members, that when we say transforming retail is about taking on inequality in this country. And so while there's less occupational identification in the retail sector, all workers want to be treated with dignity. And so while we don't organize around one particular identity, we're not an immigrant uh, justice organization, uh, we, our membership actually reflects the diversity of the retail workforce in this country. Many of the leaders of our campaigns are young black workers, uh, trans workers, um, immigrant West African Muslim workers. If you come to our, our membership meetings, they're like a New York City subway car. Um, and and that does, that's not to say we don't organize around identity. We very much do, right? So we talk to workers about what their experience is on the sales floor. What does it mean to work in a workplace where the customer is always right? And, and, and I think that, you know, what does it mean to have to, uh, you have your cashier transaction timed and you have to, speed it up faster and faster and do it with a smile and say very specific things because you're being watched with a camera, right? And so workers are being asked, the productivity, I think Jeff, um, Peter Eichler in the, in the book, you know, talked about how workers' wages had gone up not even 2% in the past like 10 years, 
but their productivity has gone up 80%. So workers are working harder and mm -hmm. faster for fewer and fewer hours and not getting rewarded. And so this is the landscape, and our model has really been, while workers may not stay in one job a long time, they do move from store to store. And so a campaign at Yellow Rat Bastard leads to a campaign at unique thrift stores. A campaign at Scoop NYC leads to a racial discrimination fight at Rag and Bone. The fight against on-call shifts at Abercrombie & Fitch leads to the fight against racial discrimination and full-time jobs access at Victoria's Secret. And so that is a part of our organizing model. We have an analysis of the growing precarity in the retail sector, and we seek to actually build power across the industry so that when workers are part-timed at Burlington Coat Factory, they don't just have to reckon with the workers who are demanding more hours that are their employees, but they have to face down right with workers from Victoria's Secret, from Abercrombie and Fitch, from Macy's, from H&M that say, look, we know what you're doing. And the, the National Retail Federation is the hub where, where you're learning these practices, but, but we're going to push back and we're going to use all the tools that are available to us to take mm -hmm. this on. So many of them are advocacy tools like litigation and the media, uh, but we are engaged in direct organizing and, and bargaining across the sector. I want to talk a little bit about that just-in-time phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Is it just a phenomenon of technology that your workers are having to go through this nightmare Could, now? Before Carrie answers, could, Carrie, can you also tell people about on-call scheduling? Yeah, yeah. so, mm -hmm. so the, yeah. the technology, on-call scheduling, Abercrombie & Fitch is a leader in this, um, where workers have to, they get scheduled for a shift that doesn't guarantee them any hours. So they have to call two hours before and either uh, you know, scramble for a babysitter that day um, if they're lucky enough to get hours, or um, risk not not being able to report to work because they don't arrange for last minute childcare. And and a lot of employers are leading to this practice. And there's actually, it's this way for workers to be available, but but um, you know, available to work, but not necessarily be getting scheduled for hours that um, enable them to support their families. So so in terms of technology, though, it's interesting. So. The part-time employment trend has been going on for a long time. It's, it's the technology that has enabled um, for new levels of instability to be structured into workers' jobs. Um, it's, it's the way in which the technology has enabled them to analyze productivity um, and not really have to, to pay for moments in which they're not making money. Um, it's workers that are paying for it. And so the question on technology, it's not technology to blame. Um, it's who's controlling the technology. Many employers are using the same exact technology, but giving workers more input into how they're scheduled. Um, and that new levels of, of um, worker-driven flexibility are being achieved through the very same technology. And so it's not the technology to blame. It's who's, who's controlling the technology. And, and what, is the, what are you looking to get out of the technology? Is it only always oh, just maximizing, squeezing the, ma the most profit that you can? Or is it finding a space in which workers can balance their, their personal lives and their work lives? Um, and, and are other values going into to what they're looking for from, from this, this workforce optimization technology? I, I have to just say, I just came back from um, Kentucky, Virginia, and West Virginia. Uh, I've done a lot of coverage of, of movements there, particularly labor. And I come back to this spot with that <clears throat> picture in my mind of the last week spent in coal country, uh, where you see writ really large, and on the landscape both of the, the, the land and of the people's bodies, um, these issues that we're talking about, about labor, control, capital, and frankly change, the future. Um, there you see the impact of monopoly industry, coal and minerals. You see the impact of monopoly organizing, the UMWA. I covered the Pittston strike when I was 12, I think, <laughs> in 1989. <laughs> and the atmosphere there of solidarity was palpable. You knew which side you were on. You knew which side the other guy was on. Everybody was mobilized. It was a fight that was a community fight, a cultural fight, a political fight around much more than just a job and much more than just today's workers. It was about yesterday's workers and your grandparents and tomorrow. And the guy that I just met in Lynch, Kentucky, talked about how he decided to go and stay in the, in the mines underground even though he hated the work because he wanted to work on the health and safety committee after he lost three fingers. 
and wanted to make sure that that didn't happen again. And then he went and worked on the city council to make sure that there would be jobs for, for, the, for the children. And now he's working to try to bring in tourism so that there'll be jobs for his grandchildren. That sense of continuity is palpable. Um, but so too today is the sense of loss. That industry isn't there in the same way. It's not the fate of God. It's not caused by God or caused by technology, but choices. That union is no longer there in the same way and has made some odd choices about how to relate to the community in agreeing to participate in the blowing up of the landscape, literally. Um, so you have, I like to think of it as trans Appalachia. And it's always trans places are interesting places. And it's a tr community in transition with incredible ideas bubbling up, and yet a power structure that is almost impermeable, a power structure that it's going to take all of us to work with our friends in Appalachia to change the future there in terms of power, control, leverage, who has it. Um, so I want to ask you, Ed, something, a, a, big, a bit of a bigger picture question about labor. Um, Carrie sort of indicated that the technology itself is not responsible. It's how we use it. Is it, is it, I don't know, a function of the weather that our labor movement is in the situation that it's in? And more directly, what are the roots of some of the new organizing? Uh, is this totally new, or are there ro roots we can plug into? Well, you know, it, it's, it's odd. I and mean, you listen to this description of what work has become. Uh, and you have choices with the technology. Uh, Fifteen years ago, we had a conference on the technology's potential impacts, and we talked then about how it could be the new enclosure acts or it could be very liberating. Um, and it's turned into the new enclosure acts. It's driving people into situations that are dehumanizing, disempowering, disenfranchising. Um, I think that if you look at the book and the, and the work that the authors did, one of the things that I came to the conclusion of fairly early on in, in my time at the Central Labor Council was if we're going to deal with this new reorganization of, of capital in the world economy, um, there had to be room for experiment. And there wouldn't be a one-size-fits-all model. And one of the problems I think that the unions had is what unions do very well is they're designed to protect what people have. At some point, they organize workers, they, but the organization matures. And they tend to try to hang on to what is. And when you get into one of these periods where everything changes, it is not really what the unions have done well. Workers hear the word new, and they have learned over history that new generally means not us. Mm -hmm. So they turn to their organizations to protect what they have. So we resist the technology rather than try to capture control of the technology. So that's a mistake. But if you think back, what can we build on? Well, at one point in our history, and you'd come into the 19th to 20th century, industrial work was the dirty, dangerous, insecure, low-paid work. And workers organized, and they developed models that we now like to refer to as we built the middle class. Well, the truth is we fought back. We refused to be disempowered, and we ref refused to be disenfranchised. That, movements like the Civil Rights Movement, the Women's Movement, you can fight back. So what do we build on? If you look at these projects, every one of them, they knew how to organize. Most of the groups that were fighting to, to get to adjust to this new reality right, are very, very skilled. The taxi workers have forced, think about this, they have no legal status as employees. The industry and the city of New York can do nothing without them. And they have led two strikes in this city. They have achieved health care for their workers without the legal right to collectively bargain, people bargain all the time. We can't lose sight of those windows. But the role of those of us in the labor unions that had some access to power was to kick the damn doors open. That's the job. They will organize themselves. Let's do it, yes. Can I intervene here? It's, I think that Ed did an incredible job in making sure that the doors were opened and telling the New York labor movement that they had to rethink who it is we are um, and how we become inclusive. Um, I think that there's a tendency in labor to say, as our numbers shrink, well, the problem must be out there and not us, that people don't understand our message, 
that we have to find a more effective way to tell people who we are rather than asking, do we need to change ourselves? And that hasn't been happening enough. I want to give one example. I want to bring the car wash workers, the car wash heroes, into this conversation. Um, because I think that we got involved in the car wash campaign because the late John Kest from New York Communities for Change came to Deb Axe, came to the union, and said that we need to focus on this group because people are being exploited. What's happening to them um, is not above the radar. Um, that it's an opportunity to show that low-wage immigrant workers, regardless mm -hmm. of documentation <coughs> status, can and will stand up and organize. And it is another model of organizing where we do it not just as a union, but we try to get something that is a more holistic approach where it's Make the Road and New York Communities for Change and the RWDSU and each of us bring different elements to the table but are trying to deal with the worker in their totality and not just a section of their life. Um, if I could take a moment more, what I want to say is that the car wash campaign is an effort to change the industry in New York and in the process We've organized workers at eight car washes, the only car wash workers anywhere east of Los Angeles to be organized. And we have six contracts mm -hmm. that not only increase wages and what people learn and protect tips, which is really important, mm -hmm. and provide people paid days off, which they didn't have before, and give them the opportunity to go away to their home country on a leave of absence and not have to worry about whether or not there is a job when they come back, but it has changed power in the workplace. Talk a bit about where you feel you've had to learn or change. I know in the living wage campaign you got a lot of grief when uh, the union cut a deal with, the, with, with Chris Quinn on a we've, compromised bill. Um, we've, I, I think that Along the way, um, there have been growing pains. We make mistakes along the way. Not everything has been right. Um, we had to feel comfortable with our partners as well. The reason we're working so well on the car wash campaign is because um, Jeff got us involved in Despierta Bushwick with Make the Road many years ago. So we, we have experience with each other and most importantly, we develop trust in each other. Do you want to weigh in on this, Deborah? Yeah, I would. I mean, I think the car wash campaign um, grew out of, indeed, like over a decade of, of deep partnership, right? And of multi layered relationships um, between Make the Road and RWDSU, as well as New York Communities for Change. Um, and I think what we're seeing in New York right now is that we have several organizations with those kinds of multi dimensional relationships among them. So where we're building a broad base that's active politically, right? We have community organizations that also have C4 operations. Some of those C4s have PACs, right? So some is literally political, but a lot of it's just 501C3 voter engagement and issue campaigns. And so we were able to collaborate in a really deep way with all of our union partners on the paid sick days fight, for example. And so which played a, a really decisive role in changing the landscape and narrative and opening up space for Bill de Blasio to step in and actually win this, right? That along with the paid sick day, I mean, I'm sorry, with the stop and frisk fight were really transformative to creating this space where working people were out in the streets demanding of their boss, demanding of their government some respect for our dignity as human beings, right? And that, I think, just transformed the, the feel of the electoral politics. But we, it wasn't by accident, right? It was because we have unions helping to support and invest in broad-based and deep and robust community organizations with sophisticated policy operations, legal operations, and real long-term base building. So that we're building a permanent base that can now hold de Blasio accountable, right? And there's a lot that's left to be won. I mean, even in the paid sick days fight, I mean, it, it, we're at a beautiful moment with it. 
we did not win a private right of action on paid sick days. Right. Right? So I feel like the closer we get, all, what we really do is we see behind the curtains of power. And there is a lot left to be won before victories like the policy ones that, that we're so proud of, justifiably so, um, really become real in, in workers' everyday lives. And so I think that if we don't continue to deepen those partnerships, we're going to. I'm going to say something provocative and hopefully I it. don't end up becoming the least popular person in the room, but that's okay. I often am. Um, sometimes New York City holds us back. And the way we think in New York City holds us back. I do feel that way. A so, couple of different examples. One, um, even thinking about this conversation as an alt-labor conversation, when you've got the two largest private sector industries in the United States here, these are the two largest private sector industries in the United States. We're not talking about a marginal workforce. We're talking about the largest employers in the US, and sometimes the concept of immigrant workers and alt labor, as we've often thought of these things in New York City, um, constrains us from understanding that we're we're actually talking not about an alt labor, but about just labor. This, these are the these are the largest workforces. And like Carrie, Rock actually was never exclusively an immigrant organization, and now we're not even a majority immigrant. We're by far not a majority immigrant organization nationally. We're largely led by people of color and working people in the restaurant industry nationally. And I have felt that that kind of um, imagery of this is largely immigrant workers, this is largely all, you know, ex uh, excluded workers or marginalized workers ends up uh, not helping people understand or even ourselves understand the potential of the scale and the power that we could have if we're not thinking about this as marginalized immigrant excluded workers, but instead thinking about ourselves as we are the largest workforce in America and we demand change now. You know, and so that, that new frame outside of New York has allowed us to realize that a lot of the things that we had been fighting for in the past were actually not, not ambitious enough by far, that we were fighting for half of what we really needed and wanted. What we, so for example, if you'll let me go there, on the tip minimum wage fight, for so many years here we had been talking about just getting tipped workers included in the minimum wage fight. Just give us 50%, 60%, give us 70% of the overall minimum wage. And going to other parts of the country and develop, talking to workers and, develop, and developing an understanding that 70% of tipped workers in America are women, you know, which is very different from New York City where 70% of restaurant workers are men. So you know, in the rest of the country, you're talking about, and the rest of the state even, New York State, you're talking about women who work at the IHOP and the Applebee's and Denny's and Red Lobster and earning poverty wages and experiencing the worst sexual harassment of any industry in the United States because they're living off their tips. And so developing a whole new framework that no woman in America should ever have to rely on tips for any portion of her income, not for 50% or 20% or 10%. No portion of anybody's income should be tips because tips are not wages. No consumer in New York City or anywhere else thinks of tips as wages. So why the F are we fighting for 50 or 60 or 70% when we should be fighting for 100%? And, and so that has led us to huge things, you know, not just a federal debate, but frankly, very large ballot initiatives with C4 and PACs and these kinds of things where we're raising millions of dollars to eliminate the lower minimum wage altogether in large states. And still having this conversation in New York City about uh, could we even ever get tipped workers in, included in a minimum wage increase. So sometimes I feel like Something, some, something about us feeling, and I know I was a New Yorker for a very long time, that we are the center of the universe and we are the leaders on everything progressive and everything that changes, that we founded the worker center movement, is just not true, first of all. And second of all, in some ways holds us back from learning about our true power, our true potential, our true ability to completely change the narrative and stop thinking of ourselves as excluded or marginal or this little population, but frankly, the main population of the United States. It's like w women as a special interest. Women as a special, or immigrants. And, and I just want to say, I really give a lot of credit to Rin Sen, who's been a real mentor to me over the years and who wrote a book about our work uh, called The Accidental American. And in it, she used this frame 
of explicit but not exclusive. So I am not saying that that immigrant workers are, haven't led this movement. They led our movement. We were immigrants. We started this movement. But the point is to be explicit about mm. race and immigrant leadership and not exclusive about race and immigrant leadership. Right. To be explicit about gender discrimination. To be explicit about, you know, frankly, tipped worker discrimination. To be explicit about things, but not exclusive. And not to exclude ourselves by painting ourselves as the marginalized immigrant mm. people of color workers, but rather for everybody in New York City and around the country to understand it's not just immigrants who work in restaurants. We all have, probably yeah. many people in this room have worked in restaurants. When I go speak in the Senate, senators come up to me and say, I worked in a restaurant. We've, we've all mm. experienced this industry, and we need it to change for all of us. So, Stuart, I know you want to come in, but I want to bring Sorry. Ruth in first. As the woman who, who with Ed, edited this book about <laughs> New York, um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the shortcomings of some of the focuses in foci that have emerged from this experience on minimum wage, on low wage work. Well, it's first of all, the alt labor term, as I understand it, is not a reference to the workers, but rather to the organizations. Um, so the the old traditional labor movement is in deep crisis. We've been saying that for decades now, and it's mm -hmm. it's true. <laughs> that system is not working anymore. The National Labor Relations Act is dead for all intents and purposes. So alt labor refers to the alternative forms of organizing, including rock, that have sprung up to try to address that crisis, and so that's one clarification. The precarious work phenomenon that we have been talking about today and that the book focuses on is by no means limited to immigrant workers. They are more affected by it than any other group probably, but it's happening throughout the economy. One of the chapters in the book that we haven't mentioned yet is about the freelancers yeah. union, which is mostly professional and other white collar type um, membership, but they are just as precarious as anybody else. They are contract workers, um, temporary workers, things like that, working on short-term assignments. So I completely agree that this is a broad phenomenon. Um, and no, New York was not the leader of this. If any place was a leader, it was Los Angeles, um, I have to say, and, and especially in, in the synergies between organized labor of the old-fashioned kind and alt labor, that's where it's happened the most. That's how I first got interested in this when I lived out there. And, and New York is a little bit behind the curve, but but I feel like it's, um, it's beginning to happen here, partly thanks to people like Stuart. It's possible. I, I think we do talk about marginalized workers and we talk about immigrant workers. And I think it's part of a New York perspective because um, a vast majority of all workers in this city can still be marginalized by a power elite that refuses to recognize them. And I think that um, I saw at one point over 50% of all workers in New York City are immigrant workers. And the reason it's important to talk in these terms is because that the established movement for too long has, understood, has failed to understand the changing of um, what it means to be a worker in New York and has continued to ignore the workers in the city um, who need to come together in collective action and with a collective voice. Workers. One of the points that Carrie makes, and I'm sure you make too, about New York is this is where a lot of flagship stores are. This is where a lot of national big power players are. And I'd like you to speak to that question of how do we go after where the power is. Um, that's been one of the critiques of the fast food work mobilization and the minimum wage mobilization is that it's not keep helping us to keep our eyes on the prize of where the big power players are in our economy. Carrie? Our membership base is in New York, but every time we launch a fight in New York, it takes us other places, right? I mean, the, the boundaries of the workforce are, are lessened when you have the internet, right? Every time one of our members launches a petition, we get in touch with thousands of Victoria's Secret workers across the country or Juicy Couture workers across the country, and I think that, um, there is a space in which, when we talk about scale, right, what does scale mean? Does it mean going deep in one place and really leveraging the full power of, of community alliances, right? When the customers say, well, if I'm right, this is what I say, right? I say I want to work in a place where the people that are serving me are, are treated with dignity, right? There is there's something that's, that, that there is new potential, right, in going deep in one place, and I think Make the Road embodies that potential. 
but I do think, you know, when you look at, at what Rock has done, going national, if we want to, I think a lot of people have given up on the potential of federal policy change, right? <laughs> and, I, and I think that we shouldn't. I think that, I think that there is, we need to still hold the people that we send to Washington, D.C. accountable. I think we need to, to nuance what we mean when we talk about scale and what we mean when we talk about power, right? Like, RAP is a, engages in minority unionism practices, right? We have to organize fast because the turnover in the industry, in like three months, the entire workforce is different, right? And so when you're talking about these precarious places where there is still a workplace, um, you have to organize fast and you have to use the moments in which are created. And I, and I think that there is a, the, I don't know if getting to, how do you balance that, right? How do you seize the moment from where you are and then think about a long-term fight? And do you anchor on one big employer or do you take the opportunities where there are and go across an industry and hold them all accountable? And I, I think these are some of the questions that RAP is wrestling with um, in terms of, of where we are. But, but when, while our membership base is in New York, we're taking on multinational corporations. And so it's enabled us to have our members' voices be a counterpoint to the National Retail Federation that's bragging about retail means jobs. And our members are saying, well, what kinds of jobs? I don't know if these are the jobs that that our country needs. Uh, are citywide, are, are national um, contracts a thing of the past, Ed? Well, you know, capital's mm -hmm. fragmented the workforce, so uh, I don't think they see national regulation or national contracts in their best interest. And, it, you know, w we did well on the monopoly. Um, the trucking industry, when it's basically over the road truck and is controlled by several companies and regulated, uh, the workers did much better. Uh, they kind of knew that. Uh, the problem that we had is as we moved into this era of both deregulation and new technology, uh, the labor unions, we missed a lot. Uh, and we didn't try to get ahead of the curve, particularly on the technology. We, we tr the first attempts in most places was to resist it. You know, you mentioned West Virginia. I mean, part of what the United Mine Workers there did, and if anybody's got a history with them, I half apologize. But they've defended the coal industry, the filthiest, most dangerous, economically terrorist organizations right. in the world mine coal. And they've defended their right to strip those mountains, to, to pollute the waters and everything else in the defense of jobs. Get over it. Right. If there's, you know, I don't like to use the term good jobs and bad jobs because all work is dignified and, and contributes to the organization of society. But if we're going to have bad jobs, bad jobs rape the earth. And we don't have to defend them. What we should have done is demand what Mazaki was trying to do with the nuke workers in the 70s and 80s. Guarantee the workers a, a, a lifetime income and get the hell out of it and onto something cleaner and better. Uh, we made a lot of fundamentally wrong decisions as the world changed. It took us 10 years to realize the Cold War was over. It may and, not be. And that capital was going to reorganize and that there was no possible alliance between U.S. labor and U.S. capital. They weren't interested. The whole world is migrating. The South's coming north. The Chinese are going everywhere. Eastern Europe goes to west. And we are circling the wagons in the U.S. acting like we're victims of immigration. Mm -hmm. No. This is the economy. Mm -hmm. Get over it. <laughs> I'm still not hearing power. I mean, the, what, the legacy of power, UMWA power, in Virginia these is organizing, no These organizing power projects left. that are talked about here, power doesn't just happen. Rock has power. They play big. It's not, they don't have hundreds of millions of dollars, but they have impact. When we started the labor union movement, we didn't have two nickels to rub together. We had an idea. We were taken down by a set of ideas. Out of these struggles, I think, will emerge new ideas. But power is not going to be given to us. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to take it. And I, frankly, am uncomfortable at this point in my life trying to describe what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Some of the old will get there with it. Most of it will be creations of a new generation of workers dealing with new circumstances. And I remain optimistic in the general good sense of the masses. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the good sense of the masses was reflected, uh, it seems to me, at least in part not so long ago, in those talking transition weeks, the weeks of talking transition at the talking transition tent that the Ford Foundation and others helped to make possible. I was struck by how many people showed up to talk for how long about the future of New York City. And, and I want to come back to New York as we begin to close, and then we're going to come to your, we're going to take a little break and then come to questions. Um, 
And, and Deborah, Carrie, everybody, I'd, I'd love you to weigh in on strategies here now. Clearly, part of what has happened over the time of your, that we've been discussing is the creation of a new sense of civic identity uh, in new populations, <coughs> a new sense of optimism in Stuart um, and others as well uh, about where, what we might be able to accomplish. You have all alluded, I think, to the new administration in New York. There is a line in your book, I think a quote from Stephen Lerner, where he talks about labor unions being just big enough and just connected enough to be constrained from actually making trouble. Is there a danger of that in New York? Do you feel constrained, Deborah? I mean, I think that's absolutely a, a big fear. Um, I mean, we are currently doing a, another project um, to organize bank workers. And when we talk about organizing workers, I mean, it's a little bit mind-blowing to be or talking to bank workers at the same time we're talking to car wash workers, right? So the car wash campaign is clearly an effort to demonstrate that the sort of lowest rungs of the economic ladder can really be organized, that we can win, right? That we can put together legislative strategies and litigation and, and bottom up good old fashioned militant street organizing and win something in a low wage industry, right? Organizing banks is about going after global capital, right? Uh, talk about the seat of power, right? Uh, we've got to figure out, though, how you raise workers' expectations. How do you create an expectation with a group of workers that not only are you entitled to be treated better by these banks, but you have some ability to win against them? And to be frank, that's going to be a long-term project, right? And so who we are capable of taking on as targets um, and at what moment in time? I mean, we wouldn't, frankly, be jumping into that if we didn't already have the student debt movement and the anti-foreclosure movement and you know multiple layers um, of unruly organizing, which we think has the potential to really spark something exciting um, that we think makes it worth jumping in. But I think it is going to take unruly organizing. Mm -hmm. And frankly, we as an institution are sometimes a little bit nervous about that too. We have carefully cultivated inside and outside strategies, right? We have very close relationships with many political leaders. Um, we, you know, do policy design with our 35 person litigation team, right? So, so we're not actually, we don't have a natural bent towards completely unruly organizing. Um, but I think we've got to push ourselves in that direction. Do you have all the funding you need? That's actually, I think another really exciting thing that's happening at this moment in time is the conversation between union leadership and foundation um, and those, so the mixing up of those worlds. I feel like foundations are, are finally saying, you know, backing off of the position that it's union's jobs to organize workers. Um, and obviously Ford Foundation has been at the forefront of, of trying to drive that. But I think if we can sort of coordinate the dedication of resources to big fights, going after big targets, um, and really that, that foundations can also are playing a role in helping to push the unions in a more progressive direction um, and that all of that comes together in a meaningful way. Anything you want to <laughs> add perhaps on this question of sustainability and how do you get to scale? Stuart and I have had a lot of honest conversations about the tension between um, organized labor that knows it needs to change and hasn't quite figured out how it needs to change and then the recog and then investing in really innovative organizing approaches that that really I think the worker center movement and I think we're starting to realize that even with very little resources um, and and varying landscapes of scale are having an impact right I think that we've mm -hmm. seen that this past year what it means to to have an <coughs> impact and I think that there is this pivotal moment right now where um, where I think that when we see this scaled fast food worker organizing or the, the campaign to take on Walmart, and we invest millions and millions of dollars in these scaled efforts, when the money dries up, what do we have left? And I think that's a, a question that we need to be asking ourselves. Are we developing the leadership and the base and the, doing the political education with workers that will keep fighting long after someone is getting paid to keep them inspired to keep up that fight. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a question we need to ask. And I think the Occupy Wall Street movement instilled in us the imagination that that's possible. But, but I think that um, these are kinds of the questions that we need to ask. And are we building the movement sustaining infrastructure to be ready for the moments, uh, to, to seize the moment uh, when, when, that, when that happens? Mm -hmm. I, I really, I really, for me, the lesson of the last year, maybe especially the last six months, has been that we, we just, I just don't feel that we've been ambitious enough, and we need to keep 
we need to keep dreaming much bigger than we have been dreaming. And I will just give you one example of something that happened and, and why I think Ed is so right that you know you can think about power in many different ways and I have a particular feeling of it right now. <laughs> Which is, so one example is um, you know several years ago when we started organizing employers in New York City it was about uh, having a group of employers who could say this is the high road to profitability, this is telling other employers this is how you can do it and still treat your workers well, blah, blah, blah. And not so much engaging them as the leaders of the fight. You know, we would do the fight and let the employers talk to other employers. Well, about six months ago, an employer reached out, said, I've read your book, I want to change my restaurant after reading your book and uh, did, ended up you know, instituting all these new practices, raising the wages, paid sick days, all this stuff. He said, I want to get all the gold awards in your app. And um, ended up becoming a member of, of our organization and ended up with me really embracing the idea that we just need to eliminate the system of lower tip wages for workers. And we just need to frankly get to a place where tips are not wages at all. And we set up a meeting uh, with Secretary Perez, Department of Labor, with a bunch of employers from around the country. And this employer hosted it. He's the owner of the Florida Avenue Grill, which is the oldest soul food restaurant in America, and uh, in the world, actually. And then, uh, and then a few days ago, when the White House finally released a report on tipped workers and, and that tipped workers' wages should go up, Joe Biden actually went to Imar's restaurant, to the Florida Avenue Grill, because the, he had met with Secretary Perez and said, we're honoring you for raising your tipped worker wages. And Imar just handed him my book and said, this is why I did it. And, and this is why we need this country to change. And we need the NRA. The NRA doesn't speak for me. And, and this is why our alternative association is so important. And what is amazing about that is that um, this past, you know, every year we have been going and holding flash mobs and doing things against the National Restaurant Association. And this past year, when our employers announced their alternative National Restaurant Association, the NRA showed up and protested our event, which was such a, uh, which was such a turning of tables. And since that moment until now, what to me is an indication of power, there is a dude who follows me around. He's paid to follow me around. I'm not kidding. His name is Mike Paranzino, and he works for an organization called Rock Exposed that is funded by the National Restaurant Association. And here's a guy who spends all his time trying to find ways to, to literally destroy me and Rock. And that, to me, is a little bit of power, because capital is spending all kinds of money trying to destroy us. And, um, and that's a little bit of power. Not a lot, but 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 we are beginning to feel mm -hmm. how, what it would really be like to counterbalance the National Restaurant Association, which was a dream when we were here in New York, and not a big enough dream. Mm -hmm. And we're finally getting to feel it, so now we're dreaming even bigger. So are we to led to believe that if your book could do that for you, get you a mic, <laughs> that Ruth and Ed could soon be followed by their own guy? <laughs> I hope that for you. <laughs> right. I want to thank you all. Yeah, thank you.